I'm now uh, happy to say that Ganesh is here with us. To introduce Ganesh very quickly, so I like to call Ganesh the granddaddy of all uh, uh, Tava proctors. He's proctored all my proctors. He's been in the Tava field way back when the valve started. And I can take the liberty of calling him this granddaddy because I have a lot of courage with the ocean between both of us, like I mentioned earlier. So, Ganesh. <laughs> Hi, Ganesh. Hello, Ed. Good. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everybody. First of all, thanks Sai and his team for arranging this. Um, I got a ping from him about a week ago, Sai, I think. And I said, uh, he said, what about, what do you think? And I went, well, you know, yeah, go ahead, make sure others can join. The next day he pinged by saying, all can join today. I said, well, it's about a week away. Do you think you can arrange it? And amazingly, he's done it with his team. So congratulations to you and your team for what I think has come out as a very nice uh, and educative session. So uh, with that, um, Tavi and bicuspid anatomy. These are my uh, disclosures. So bicuspid aortic valve, very briefly, the incidence is about one to two percent in the population um, is aortic stenosis most frequent complication in a way, uh, accounts for most common reason for surgical AV on the young. And uh, remember that it can involve the aortic root and the ASN aorta as well, with this, uh, increased risk of dilatation and uh, dissection if you're advancing a transcatheter valve. Uh, on these uh, arthropathic patients. Um, there are different ways of classifying that. I'm gonna skip that. And surgically again, um, you can see that it comes in many, many forms. But interestingly, despite the historical data suggesting that um, bicuspid predominates a younger age group history, but with CT now, we are now seeing that almost a quarter, a one fifth, you know, over 22% of elderly patients tend to also have um, some variant of a bicuspid anatomy, which we're already seeing in our practice. And I think this is the uh, superior power of CT in looking at anatomy versus just physiology. Now, remember that bicuspid valve comes in numerous shapes and forms. This is just a, a, a snapshot of what we've all seen from what looks acceptable to what looks just like a big white blob of calcium sitting there. Uh, I think you can almost predict, you can get a reasonably good result here. But something like this, you know, you are almost in the land of the gods wondering what will actually happen once you deploy the valve or even try to cross that valve. So I think that's the important thing. No matter what trials come out, uh, what randomized study you look at, the reality is um, these type of anatomies change so rapidly. I, I mean, my eyes were opened when I started proctoring in Asia. I thought I knew bicuspid valve until I went to Asia, Vietnam, China, India what they see there is very, very different. And the age group is much younger as well. So I think that's important to remember. The challenges for bicuspid anatomy are these, I think elliptical configuration, the annulus, angulation, the annulus to the uh, root and the ascending, dilated, dilated root and the ascending aorta, very large scallopy leaflets can be a challenge, both in terms of crossing the valve, but also the impact it may have on the um, coronary arteries after deploying the valve and trying to work out where to position your valve. Remember, they tend to be very deep, variable depth in sinuses. So using the traditional sinus alignment may not completely work for all your bicuspid valves. Uh, you must know, I think, very importantly, position the coronary osteos. And sometimes in these congenitally malformed anatomies, the right coronary artery osteo can be very, very low. Uh, calcification and distribution. I think this is truly is the Achilles heel for treating bicuspid valve using a TAVI technology. I think the distribution and severity can really make a pleasant procedure becomes exceedingly uh, tortuous and challenging. And then the presence of aortic regurgitation pre and post, especially post, can be a challenge as well on how to deal with them. Some data, I'm going to very briefly, are very variable. And very briefly, uh, the results between the first generation, second generation, and third generation are very clear and striking. I think part of it is because we have learned a lot. And part of it is what we are now using increasingly more CT compared to what uh, was done in the early generation trial data. And secondly, the third generation devices all have a skirt on the external, external uh, part. And I think that has helped certainly the parallel leak uh, issue, but also the resheatable feature of some of these technologies have also now allowed us to have multiple goals and getting the depth right, checking different views and positions. So these trial results uh, reassuringly have significantly improved with the current generation devices. What are the risks with TAVI and bicuspids? Uh, these are very busy slides, but I think the risk of annular rupture with balloon expandable has been seen. 
post dilatation and, and Shushil has shown a very nice example where despite post dilatation, the rock just does not move. And remember, post dilating a bicuspid valve, especially if the raft is highly calcified, there's only one way it's going to go, which is uh, to externalize the uh, pathway and that causes rupture. So I think the risk of rupture is still there no matter what anatomy you pick, but certainly more so with uh, bicuspid valves. Um, the risk of the needing of second valve, again, more so in the first generation devices, but significantly lower when we start using newer and more modern generation devices, especially the ones with resheathable features and with, with external skirts. Paravalve leak, I think, um, was a big challenge in the past, increasing a lot less, but remember that um, all this trial data will depend on are you looking at all comers or pre-selected patients? And I think Paravalve leak will still be a challenge if you do have very, very significantly calcified by cusp anatomy and elliptical uh, with Rafi calcified and LBO3 calcified. So I think it's important when you see those kind of patients to go back to the MDT and consider, you know, is surgery still an option for these patients? Uh, because what you do not want is take a youngish patient who, who have very hostile anatomy, put in a valve and they have horrendous leak and these guys do not last very long once you see that. So just remember that, that there's always the backup of a surgical uh, as a primary procedure for these anatomies may be the, the better option. 30 d pacemakers, somewhat similar to um, what we have seen with the um, tricuspid valve anatomies. Again, I, I, in our, my personal view, I think the bicuspid anatomies tended to have lower pacemaker rates, mainly I think because we are deploying slightly higher in these valves than we would have used, say, in a tricuspid anatomy. Uh, and in our unit, it's been under 10% for bicuspid anatomies. 30-day um, mortality, again, reassuringly, somewhat similar compared to all the other valves. So in terms of hard endpoints, it seems to be safe. But when you look at the nuances of looking at outcomes nowadays, part valve leak, I think in bicuspid valve, at least for the first generation devices, appears to be um, slightly higher than what we would tolerate. But certainly with the new generation devices and definitely with CT uh, as a primary more, uh, technique for pre-assessing and planning a case, uh, even the power valve leak uh, story has become a lot more tolerable. Um, some of the challenges with uh, bicuspid anatomy certainly is under expansion of the valve. Uh, this can be seen and mainly because of calcification. And remember, when you push this, the only outcome you'll get is either an awesome result and everybody claps and goes home or a rupture, which would be a, 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 almost a zero one outcome for these kind of patients. Um, there's always this issue of delayed dissection. Remember that this patient by cusp anatomy is not a, just a uh, disease of the valve, it's also a disease of the aorta. So you have to take your time and be very careful when you're trying to cross these valves. Sometimes in these valves, especially if it's, uh, the root is very angulated, crossing the valve can be very difficult. And uh, you may need to use a lundicus wire, you may even need to use a, a snare to guide your valve into its uh, landing zone. And finally, there's always a risk of this sort of milking effect with delayed embolization. And again, um, this is what it goes back to what I think um, Sushil and somebody else also mentioned before, going high is fine, but going high and an embolized valve is definitely not way to end your procedure. So you do have to have this balance. Uh, and what I think I tend to do now is to release the valve up to about two thirds, uh, wait for about 10 to 15, 20 seconds, allow the valve to fully expand and also release uh, during final release, uh, and sorry, pace during final release as well, control pacing, and that improves the stability of the valve. Um, there is this, uh, and Vinny mentioned it already, uh, when you deploy these valves under expanded, and this has been already shown by the surgical uh, fraternity, when you deploy a valve not in its best hemodynamic position, there's a risk, and the risk of the valve failing uh, earlier is much quicker. So just be aware of it, that uh, you do uh, try to optimize its positioning and also its circularity with these valves. Not always easy and possible, but you need to look at that. Um, I'm going to skip that. Hemodynamics, they do your shingly is good uh, for bicuspid anatomy outcomes, regardless of the valve you use. Uh, and then uh, very quickly, the Evolute Pro outcomes, when you look at Covalve and Evolute Pro, uh, overall outcomes in all the parameters are better. Uh, again, seen in terms of mortality as well and stroke, always better. And hemodynamics, similar improvement. Paravalve leak again with a skirt is better. 
And similar findings has also been shown by Sapien 3 with its external skirt, all the outcomes, all the annual rupture, again, with CT is improved, um, stroke again better, pacemakers low. So how do you size for Vicasaval? Um, I'm going to show what I'm going to tell you what I would do, and then uh, my colleagues can uh, maybe uh, chip in at the end to show what they would do. I would tend to size my VAR based on the annulus. I then look at the LVOT. I then look at the intercommercial distance, about um, three to four millimeters. In this case, I think like the almost six millimeters above to see what is the diameter there. And then, based on all these three features, I then pick the valve size that meets the annulus and also. Uh, meets the diameter, intercommissional distance diameter. The only times I, I would change that is if I have a significant calcite rafe, and then I tend to measure the distance between rafe to the other uh, sinus to see what, if I'm gonna undersize, what size will I pick to go undersize. The other important thing when you're looking at bicuspid valve is to look at your coronary osteas, uh, because sometimes you can be caught out by a very, very low lying right coronary ostea. Anatomy is also important. In this case, you can see it's quite horizontal. So if you have a very eccentric looking sinus with a bulky uh, right coronary and a smaller left coronary or a non-coronary and the, and, and the uh, right left coronary is smaller, crossing this valve would be a challenge. Um, so looking at the angulation is important. In this case, this patient's perimeter is 88. Uh, I chose the 34 valve. I always pre-dilate a bicuspid valve. Um, mainly to improve the overall outcome and also try to cross the valve. Uh, here's the case now very quickly. So the patient already was leaking a little bit, but we still went ahead and pre-dilated. Now, the ECG was interesting. This patient had a right bundle branch block, first degree heart block, and left interfiscular block. So I just want you to look at the ECG pre-procedure. So we went with the Evolute R34 initially with the comforter wire. We had difficulty crossing the valve. This is what I was telling you about. When you have a very bulky, non-coronary, sometimes the valve will tend to uh, move towards this area and it's impossible to cross. So we then recrossed, switched to a Lundquist wire. And then we went across again with the Lundquist wire. So it's a stiffer wire. Now you have to respect the lundicus wire. You have to make sure that somebody's always watching where it is in the left ventricular cavity. And at this point, you gently advance and increase your pressure, pushing at the same time pulling the wire. And the valve crosses. Then you reposition. Align the ring, deploy the valve slowly. And I tend to go on the LEO view and don't go LEO, don't go caudal at all. Just keep going LEO, LEO until you have the ring uh, straightened out. Uh, and then uh, start deploying it. And at this point, all I do is look at the lower sinus and um, start releasing the valve. So you go up to about one third. It's not really uh, until about one third release. The valve hasn't reached the other side yet. And then once it's about reached the outside, I tend to control pace. And sometimes if there's, a, so the important thing is control pacing. What is that? It means you're not pacing 180 where there's no cutting output, you're racing about 150, 160. But sometimes if you have a very borderline anatomy where the valve and the valve's anatomy is just borderline high, I tend to go to 180, 190, just complete drop the cardiac output so that the valve is stable. And then you check again. So I think at this point, the valve is slightly too low. So we then uh, reposition, recapture. And to do that, you fix the delivery system and resheath, and it'll gently pull the valve up by itself. Rechecked again, it's nice and high on this side. It's a little on the low, but I'm hoping that the valve will fall onto the greater curvature. Which it does. And 
and you get quite a nice result post. And the key thing is the ECG has not changed post procedure. Now, I think this patient eventually still went ahead and got a pacemaker, but it just show that if you take your time and do it in controlled manner, you can get quite a good result even with hostile um, rhythm issues. So for the next final case now, functionally by Cuspid, we decided to pick a Evolute Pro 29. You can see that when you see these dark shadows, it means that there are evidence of thickened uh, fibrotic leaflets, and they tend to sometimes cause a challenge even during period adaptation because the valve may not expand uh, very well. And if you only see that in a bicuspid anatomy, there's also risk that the valve may um, melon seed during deployment. So just be wary about that. If you just see all this dark halo effect, it just means that you can see it there as well. It just means that that area is quite thickened tissues that may be more fibroelastic and not calcified. So LEO15, uh, you can see that the uh, sinus are filling reasonably okay. Um, so in bicuspid anatomy, sometimes it's better to go to an REO view um, to uh, align your valve to make sure that the pigtail is in the non-coronary. We pre-dilated successfully. Again, deploying the valve, uh, aligning your ring, pick the lowest sinus and start deploying eye only in the lowest sinus and the valve frame. And then from two thirds onwards. So again, quite nice and high. In bicuspid valve, you, you do have a luxury because you have very scallopy leaflets. So you have um, seal somewhere around here and also fixation somewhere around there as well due to the uh, rafe. So you have less risk of valve avulsion and movement uh, on release. So control pace from one third to two thirds and release at the same time. You see the depth is maintained. And you can see it's about zero to one, but it's fully expanded. So when, if you're in doubt, are you too high or too low, always go to another view. Uh, I think it's always good practice to check a second view. And I tend to go from LAO to RAO. And in this case, RAO called to align the frame. And you can see the valve is very nicely positioned. And confirmed in another view. So the LAO view is nice. LA, uh, the RAO caudal view is also good. And you can see that there's at least two millimeters subannular uh, in the RAO view. So in this case, uh, again, deployment and release again under control pacing. Final result in both views. I'm going to skip that. So in conclude, I think the bicuspid valve uh, disease is common in the elderly, more so than we originally thought. Uh, results with Tavin uh, bicuspid aortic valve overall appears to be improving uh, with the newer generation valves. But it, the key thing I think is detail planning before you do the procedure with a really detailed look at the CT, knowing how much calcium there is, where it is, and the position of the coronary arteries uh, before you start. Uh, I think finally, like everything else we do, we do need prospective study trials to say yes or no, or is it safe? But remember, I think slide three or four I showed, not every bicuspid, even if it's categorized as type one or type two, are the same because the calcification, the anatomy, completely changes the overall outcome you might find. So with that, I will stop. Ganesh, that was a riveting talk. Uh, these lectures were so good, I can't, I, I, I can't decide which one kept me more at the edge of the seat. I, uh, what a wonderful talk, although I, I was a little bit delayed, but I, I think there are a couple of things which I think uh, may be of interest for the people to know, that to find a good co-planner view in a bicuspid anatomy is a little bit difficult because there are only two cusps. And uh, the other thing is significance of the length of the rafe. If the rafe is long and rafe is calcified, then I think um, it may make the splitting of the valve a little more difficult. And entering the uh, left ventricle. Uh, do you have, Ganesh, uh, some more extra tips as to do you believe in the right coronary rule 
or uh, or do you particularly think that the they require a larger curved catheter or or you require a different kind of uh, manipulations or technique in entering the aortic valve in bicuspid uh, these are all very important and good points, Dr. Mehta. I think the key um, things I would do differently for bicuspid when crossing would be to try to use an AL2 catheters. Uh, and sometimes, uh, because the velocity across these valves are quite high, using a hydrophilic wire may not work very well. Then you take a soft-tipped um, emerald wire to cross the valve as well. Um, but I think with all of these uh, bicuspid anatomies, you really do have to take your time and try to not to rush it. Uh, because um, trying to do three, four cases in a day with, with bicuspids, um, you might end up canceling one or two patients. Can I ask a question to you and to uh, my friends here? Listening to the bicuspid, um, to the bicuspid presentation of, of Ganesh, I mean, we are doing things, you know, we know what the different sizing methodology is. To be very honest, none of those have fully convinced me. Uh, number one, they're quite complex. Number two, they're sometimes not really doable. Um, you know, yes, we do have CT, but different people measure different things. And, you know, for me, you know, proctoring or having proctored in China a lot, they, they're going very practical in many, many things. And um, as a general rule, I, I agree that we should look into um, um, into the uh, annular sizing. On the other hand, if if I it, if you know if I have to do a case, I look at uh, you know the, the the situation basically knowing that in bicuspid valves, the anchoring part is not the annulus. The anchoring part is are the leaflets or the calcified the calcified leaflets. So even if you are a little bit higher classically above zero, it wouldn't bother me too much because I've, I really have not seen any pop-outs um, in, in a bicuspid valve if you're a little bit higher. That gives you a good gradient and that gives you relatively safe. Another thing that I would like to mention is the balloon sizing. I know that is a very simple approach, but it is in fact very, very, very effective. And in, in, in many Chinese sites, this is basically um, how they finally and eventually decide. If they go with a balloon and they know it's sealing, then they would weigh, you know, for a smaller uh, device or a larger device for that matter, independent of the CT, of the CT um, sizing. And the other thing that I would like to ask, because I'm, I'm, I'm still bothered by this, do we really, given the results that we have today in bicuspid valves, which is excellent with the present valves. Do we really need a specific bicuspid valve? What many people say we need. I'm wondering what that specific bicuspid valve should be looking like. Or if given the cost of development and studies, would the result be any better than the good results that we have today? So that, that's basically a question to you guys. And there's a, you raised a lot of issues that are in that. And I think they're all important. Um, I think you have a lot of experience with bicuspids just from your proctoring experience in China. Um, and, and I think we need to really understand it. And especially like in India and China, there's a, a lot higher rate of bicuspid rheumatic disease. And their techniques may be a little bit different. You know, in, I, we, I understand your point about positioning high, and I think that's true, and I think you get away with it a lot in bicuspids because the anchoring's really on the leaflet. But the case that Ganesh showed, uh, it, yeah. it, it, bicuspid, but with the angulated aorta, with the long self-expanding, it may pop out later because this pressures are on there to go in this direction. Whereas if it's a bicuspid and your entry of angle is more like this, then the pressures on the core valve along the entire length may not be the same. Uh, if we have a short ascending, the pressures are going to be different than if you have a long ascending. Um, so there's a lot that we don't know. Um, and I think, uh, to Srinivas' point, understanding this, creating scores and, and looking at some characteristics that we haven't, and it may be different in bicuspid versus tricuspid valves, is going to be important. I think these are things where um, India can really help, and China, and where we have a lot of patients with these sort of 
uh, anatomies um, and try and understand what's best for that patient population um, and to, to really look at it. Um, and I, and because we can't say we're not going to treat bicuspids because that's the majority, significant percentage of the population, but understanding how best we can treat them, which ones can be treated safely, which ones that we really have to be cautious about. Um, and, I, and I think it's learning and I think we have to be honest. And I think part of the challenge in, in, in India is there's going to be need to be a lot more learning through courses like this and other courses because the volumes are not there. You know, all of this stuff that we've all done that we, in, you know, when you, when, you know, sites look at it and we show a case, yeah, it looks stupid because, but we learn because we did, we did stupid things because that's the only way we learn. And so the idea is to transmit that. And, and especially with bicuspids, I think to transmit more and more, not the great outcomes, but the case that Ganesh showed and, and others have shown where it's not great outcomes, but how do you manage it? Could you have predicted it? Should you have tried this case? If you had tried this case, would you use a different valve? And maybe show similar anatomies done with different valves and trying to understand that. And there's not gonna be an easy solution, but we have to understand it better. Yeah, can you, can you just say a word about developing a specific bicuspid valve? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how we do that um, because I think all bicuspids, not all bicuspids are the same. I mean, I think Ganesh highlighted it. I think a calcified raffe um, is, is important. And I think I would argue more than developing a new bicuspid valve, developing techniques to make the existing valves work with bicuspids. Whether that's sort of uh, ultrasound lithotripsy to soften the calcium when you have a calcified raffe, whether that's sort of more of a, a basilica type procedure to lacerate the leaflet uh, so that they expand symmetrically, I would, I would, I think the anatomies are so different. Rather than saying we create a bicuspid valve, I think we need to create accessory devices that help the existing devices work better in bicuspid. And by work better, it means not to, to seal better to not erupt for the aorta and to become circular. And so I think, I think softening calcium, lith lithotripsy, lacerating leaflets, those type of things uh, for, for the circularity and preventing root rupture. In terms of seal, uh, you know, different, different valves are gonna work better. Lotus, the skirts, all those things as well. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, Sushi. I'm gonna know what I'm gonna do is there's a very interesting uh, question which I would like Ganesh to take from Dr. Uh, Han Singapore. He Hello. Hi. It's a little late for you there, isn't it? Uh, can somebody unmute him, please? Jimmy Han? Hi, Jimmy. How are you doing? Jimmy, your mic's not working. Okay, so Jimmy, I'm not getting audio from you, so I'm just gonna read out your question, is that okay? Not if it is. Okay, good. Okay, another way to consider SAVA versus TAVI in, as in terms of whole life planning, perhaps TAVI can bridge a young, longer life expectancy into a tissue valve age group when he receives his open heart surgery, hence avoiding mechanical valve in this lifetime. Keeping option of valve and valve is indeed needed later in life. More durability data will probably be needed for this work. Ganesh. Those are, I mean, this is a very interesting concept. It's something that, you know, I think we've all uh, discussed, debated, thought about. It frequently comes up in many, many meetings about, you know, when do you stage a very young patient towards a, you know, so one option is keep them transcathava first, let them have about 10, 15 years from it. And then they get a open heart surgery once in a lifetime when they're in the mid forties, late fifties. And then maybe that lasts for another few more years with tissue valve and then go for transcatheter valve in valve in the end of their life. But I think as Vinny has already pointed out, all of these steps will go back ultimately to the durability of the valve the patient gets, both either surgical or transcatheter. And although in the cycle testing on the bench level, all of the transcatheter valve so far seems to work exceedingly well. In the balance of probability, uh, it is unlikely that all of these transcatheter valve will have the same longevity because the surgeons and their surgical valve have shown it. It works excellent on the bench. You put in the patient, either due to technique or whatever it is, some valves just don't go past five years. And we now have something like seven or eight transcatheter valve 
In the balance of probability, it's unlikely that all of these valves, despite being built by the best, will go past the timeline we want them to. So I think that's the key thing we need to have the answer to uh, before we can go down this very innovative thought processes that will definitely suit patients, but it's something that we think we have to wait and see. And just to follow on from Eberhardt's comment about what age do you need to think about uh, for TAVI? Um, I think it's true in the Western part of the world, we do have these guidelines and STS called that supports age. But when you go down to Asia, the longevity of life is very, very different compared to what I would see in Belfast or Germany or the US. I think in, in, in Asia, and, and I think eventually the Asia will catch up uh, with better healthcare and, and nutrition. At the moment, I think an elderly patient in India could be 65 or 70. Uh, and those patients have right. the right to decide if they want to and will have an open heart surgery versus a transcatheter valve uh, procedure. And also the risk on how these patients are assessed uh, in Asia probably will be very different from how risks are assessed uh, in Belfast or Bonn or, or uh, DC. So I think there are many, many uh, components that, that build into deciding your uh, solutions and answers. But it does go back to having that discussion with the people who know or have some experience about it. Now, this is challenging in countries where Tavi is just beginning to uh, get a foothold. And I think that's where, as Vinny has already mentioned, and uh, Sushil has already mentioned, these kind of meetings where we can share uh, knowledge, more well, not what went well, what went well, but what we did that was, looking back now, sounds my goodness, that was very, very stupid, wasn't it? But at least we could share what was very, very stupid to all of you now. Now, hopefully then you're not reinventing the stupid wheels, but you're inventing and reinventing the clever ones and improving on where we failed. And I think that's probably how uh, I would look at Tavi in India and Asia in general. Anish, that was such a balanced, uh, excellent way of, of uh, explaining this to us. We have really run short of time. I can't believe we've been at it for three hours now. It's, su it's been such a luxury. Each and every one of you has parented structural heart therapy in India. I've learned so much from each of you. We have all learned so much, and we hope to host you in India as soon as we can when this nightmare is over so we can continue to learn. Before we wrap up, could we start with uh, Dr. Grube, then Sushil and Vinny, and just have sum up points, uh, just what you'd like to say to sum up, and then we can close the session. No, I don't. I, I just wanted to thank you. I think this session here today is one of the beautiful examples how we can share our knowledge uh, to a fairly large audience and um, it opens up uh, individual questions and, and answers, things that you probably cannot do in, uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, I wanted to thank you uh, that you brought us all together on a, on a Saturday um, with excellent um, speakers uh, and a fantastic audience. As always, I'm learning a lot from, from my peers and uh, I'm, I'm very happy and very proud to be part of it. So thank you very much for having me. An honor, Dr. Grube. Thank you so much. And many more, huh? we're gonna bother you a lot more. Ganesh? Uh, again, just to echo what Abba has said once again, thank you, Sai. I know you've, um, you and your team have achieved what I thought was impossible, but I think this is the benefit of having a will and having the right technology. Uh, um, what, um, and I think the key thing is, uh, you've termed us all as masters, but I think we all agree that we are also students at the same time. We are yes, constantly yes. learning, we're constantly adapting, we're constantly changing our thought process. And I think if you want to get involved in TAVI uh, or TAVA, your original mindset must change. You must be able to evolve uh, in a daily basis, in a weekly basis. And the most important thing is not to be afraid to pick up the phone and phone a friend when you come across a CT that just does not look right. And just ping somebody and say, listen, I've just seen something. I don't like the way it looks. What do you think? And it's amazing how your colleague, even a two seconds ping saying, don't do it can change what happens for the next few years. You know, when something goes wrong, uh, you will never forget it. So I think, uh, and that's how I like to, once again, thank you again for making me part of this uh, venture. It's been a, a great success. I've learned a lot. It's great to actually see people again uh, face to face rather than just on text messages. So thank you. Ganesh, you have not mentioned the number of times I've actually called you with that question. Huh? Very gently left it out. <laughs> 
But uh, some things are better not say it, Sai. Some things are better not say it. Okay. I, I'm just going to, before Sushil and Vinny closes, I just want Dr. Ajit to come in and say hello. Uh, he's been a tremendous support to everything we do. He's one of the most academic people I know. And I just thought I'd like him to come and say hello. Uh, thanks, Sai, for organizing this lovely meeting. And I think it's, as Ganesh said, it's nice to see people face to face again and get out of this uh, this pandemic issue, which has sort of put all of us behind by a few months. But end of the day, I think this session showed us that how we should select our patients for centers in India who are just starting and many of us are doing maybe less than 50 or 100 cases. I think it's important to select the right cases and be uh, sure whether your surgical counterpart can do a better job and see that you don't have complications. And this sort of session tells us how to deal with that. I think more sessions like this will help us. Thank you very much, Sai, for organizing this. Uh, Vinny? Uh, uh, Sai, again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, this has been uh, uh, really a great session. And the most important thing is, although the TAVI has progressed, I think we still have a lot of basics to learn as well, uh, not just the advanced techniques. And I think every time I, I was just messaging Eberard that, I listened to him, I listened to Sushil, Ganesh, and actually the experience in India as well now, it, it triggers a lot of thought process in my mind. And I think it's, it's very important that uh, you continue to uh, uh, you know, do these sessions. Uh, and I think this is definitely one of the best sessions I've attended with 300 people. And uh, it has been fluid and absolutely perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Vinny, thank you so much. I know one thing, when, when, when you start thinking, there'll be innovative solutions for all of us to learn from. Thank you so much. And uh, Sushil, my dear friend, you have the floor. Uh, no, thanks, thanks, I. And I just wanted to thank uh, everyone for joining. I mean, at, at one point you had over 400 people, which is quite remarkable. Uh, I think, uh, congratulate you, this is a, gr a great idea in organizing the session. I think, uh, as Vinny said, I, I, I learn every time and think differently every time when I talk to you, Ganesh, uh, you know, Eberhard and, uh, and Vinny. Um, and I think that's part of this. And that's, with this pandemic, we, we lose that opportunity to interact and talk. And it's by talking that we think and, and do other things. And, and I think it's important. And we all are interested and we're all, you know, want to be uh, part, of, uh, part of India and, and, and education in India. And Eberhard is uh, an honorary Indian, uh, has been there so many times and has been so instrumental in, uh, in, in, in bringing technology, not from whether it's from coronaries to structural to India, that I think he has the same love and we, we want to see this grow. And I think um, uh, education is key. Um, learning uh, is lifelong, as Ganesh said. And I think we all learn and I think we should do this. And I think there are a lot of ideas about the next session, you know, from you know, uh, access, uh, balloon facilitated access uh, for iliacs with uh, lithotrips, shockwave. shockwave with uh, P PPM, with coronaries. Maybe we do tips and tricks and so people can understand and, you know, and do this on a monthly basis or a bi-monthly basis in, in short focus sessions maybe. And I think this is, this is a great start. I think we should continue it. And, and I want to thank you for organizing it. Uh, the technology worked remarkably well. There were uh, minimal audio stuff except for my end which I need to get better internet obviously um, but uh, thank you again for organizing it. Sushil, Ganesh, uh, Dr. Grube, uh, Vinny, you all accepted at the drop of a hat. It just shows how much love you have for India and how much love you have for developing therapy in India and I completely agree with you Dr. Grube is Indian. <laughs>